Distinguished speakers and participants, good afternoon from Islamabad. I welcome you all in today's panel discussion on Sri Lanka's economic crisis and what lessons can a country like Pakistan learn from it. This discussion is organized by the Center for Strategic Perspectives at Institute of Strategic Studies, which was established in 2020. The center focuses on economic and political aspects of Pakistan's relations with United States, Europe, and Russia. It also focuses on issues related to Pakistan's domestic economy, climate change, and other aspects of the non-traditional issues. More recently, the center has been focusing on issues related to Pakistan's domestic sec economic security issues and other tradition non-traditional issues. And today's event is one very important component of it. Now, as you all are aware that Sri Lanka is in the middle of an economic crisis with depleting foreign exchange reserves, along with having a shortage of food, fuel, medicines, and other daily items. Inflation is soaring at 19%, with, with food inflation touching 30%. These have catastrophic effects on the masses and have thus led to political and civil unrest in the country. South Asian countries, particularly Pakistan, must take the Sri Lankan crisis as a learning lesson and must understand the reasons that led to the economic catastrophe. The policy makers in Pakistan must come up with clear policy options to avoid the crisis like Sri Lanka. So in order to deliberate on the factors which led to the crisis in Sri Lanka, we have been joined by this wonderful panel of speakers this afternoon. Uh, our first speaker uh, may be uh, joining us soon, Mr. Akil, Director of South Asia in Initiative at South Asia Policy Institute, Washington, D.C., where his research focuses on political and economic developments in South Asia, mainly India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Our second speaker is Ms. Rehana Taufi, who is an economist with an experience of working for leading Sri Lankan think tanks. At present, she is serving as associate with Colombo-based think tank at Vakata Institute. A third speaker is Mr. Sharuk Vani, who is an economist at International Growth Center, Blavanik School of Government, University of Oxford. Mr. Vakani, uh, Vani focuses on evidence-based urban economic policy reforms across Africa, Middle East, South Asia, mainly on public finance and governance. Our last speaker is Mr. Imran Sardar, who is research analyst at Institute of Regional Studies, Islamabad. I thank you all for joining us uh, and taking out time for us to join us this afternoon. Before we start the panel discussion, I invite Ambassador Azaz Ahmad Chaudhary, Director General ISSI, for his brief welcome remarks. Ambassador Chaudhary. Thank you. Thank you uh, for organizing this timely uh, webinar. The discussion is very important. Uh, Sri Lanka uh, uh, is a friend of Pakistan, uh, had stood by it, and we are obviously all very sad and anxious on the news coming out of Sri Lanka. I have personally visited this country uh, a number of times and have many good friends there, uh, and I've always admired their courage uh, and tenacity. Uh, today's uh, tweet by the Prime Minister, Mr. Vikram Senge, actually caught my attention and sort of uh, uh, sounded alarm bells because he said that the next couple of months will be the most difficult ones of our lives. I have no desire to hide the truth and to lie to the public. Although the facts are unpleasant and terrifying, this is the true situation. I think in that sense, I am happy that the Sri Lankan leadership uh, uh, is not fudging the matter and taking the problem head on. The challenge is enormous. Again, uh, I picked up these figures from the Sri Lankan Prime Minister's tweets. The revenue is 1.6 trillion and expenditure is 4 trillion, so deficit of 13%. Pakistan too is running a deficit of 5 to 7% fluctuates, which, is, which can tell you the story. Foreign exchange reserves were 7.5 billion in November 2019, and today are 1 million. Again, a steep drop. Petrol stocks only for one day, power outages could go up to 15 hours a day and even supplies of medicine could be disrupted. Now, these are 
Indeed, as the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka says, these are terrifying figures. Uh, and therefore, uh, um, we do hope that uh, Sri Lanka will be able to come out of this huge, huge crisis. What got it there and what can pull it out of there is something that we want to hear from the speakers today and we would hopefully benefit from their wisdom and then share the outcome of, uh, of this uh, uh, program, this event um, with the policymakers of Pakistan as well. So thank you so much and back to you, Neela. Thank you, Ambassador Chaudhary. Uh, for the speakers, uh, the, uh, the format of this panel discussion is like this, that we have two main components of the discussion. Firstly, we will uh, focus on the factors that have led to the economic crisis in Sri Lanka. And the second format, we'll be focusing on what are the policy options for Pakistan in order to avert a situation like this in Pakistan. So we have two speakers uh, who will be discussing the Sri Lankan case, and then we'll be having the other two speakers who will be giving us the policy options or the factors that needed to be looked into in order to see the situation in Pakistan. So uh, uh, welcome, Akil, for joining us this evening. Uh, 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 the floor is yours for your take on what are, what is the, how is the economic crisis in Sri Lanka and what led to the crisis at the moment? So your take uh, on this. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> and I would defer to Rehana a little bit more on the economic crisis. So what I would like to speak about, about is kind of the mistakes that Sri Lanka made that got them into this crisis. Um, and so there are three pivotal mis mistakes that I would argue that caused Sri Lanka to fall into this economic crisis um, besides uh, poor economic policy planning. The first was after President Gotabaya Rajapaksa um, came into office in 2019, um, and then the COVID-19 pandemic hit in 2020. One of the key issues was, is that at the, even at that point, Sri Lanka's debt was considered to be unsustainable. And there was an unwillingness within the political leadership to acknowledge that there was a debt, debt sustainability crisis. So Sri Lanka relies heavily on foreign exchange from tourism and from garment exports. Both of those sources of revenue dried up at the, at the onset of the pandemic. Um, tourism is the third largest source of foreign exchange currency. Um, so of course, from April to November, there was no tourism to Sri Lanka as it sought to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. It then tried a trial program with uh, visitors from Russia and Ukraine, but unfortunately that didn't pan out in the way that Sri Lanka wanted. Um, so knowing this, Sri Lanka did not have kind of the foreign exchange revenues to sustain itself. Um, but as I mentioned, there wasn't a, a willingness by the leadership to accept that fact. Now, there are another few things uh, to keep in mind is that Sri Lanka did not qualify for the World Bank's debt service suspension initiative, unlike Pakistan, which did. So that meant it needed to negotiate with its creditors in order to receive a break on it on debt repayments. Yet the government was unwilling to do that. Um, so while they approached the IMF for rapid finance instrument, so the rapid finance instrument is basically a bridge loan. Legally speaking, the IMF could not loan to Sri Lanka um, because Sri Lanka's debt was considered to be unsustainable. Now, I would argue here that Sri Lanka's big strategic mistake was not engaging, was that it refused to engage with creditors on debt restructuring. So had it engaged with, it, with creditors on a debt restructuring, that would have given the IMF enough cover to say, okay, you're taking enough time and you're working on this problem let's we will grant you the loan in exchange um, to show that you're willing to can, to take on this challenge sri lanka approached the imf directly without um, engaging in debt restructuring talks and as a result the imf could not legally lend to sri lanka the second angle i would say is that sri lanka was also it also alienated key partners by making strategic um, decisions that went against its key partners and also benefited China. So for example, when the Sri Lanka, when the Rajapaksa government came into power, they declined a US Millennium Challenge Corporation grant for $480 million. Now, it's important to know that this was a grant, not a loan. So the grant was basically free money from the government of the US to Sri Lanka in order to execute development projects. 
this loan got wrapped up in hypernationalism and became a symbol uh, for for the government about um, impeding on Sri Lanka's sovereignty. So ultimately, the deal was cancelled, um, and Sri Lanka lost out on that. And I would note that this is similar to the situation in Nepal, where there was pressure on the Nepalese government to not take the MCC grant. Second, in September 2020, the Sri Lankan government um, canceled a $1.5 billion light rail transit project, which they claimed was not cost effective, um, but had not effectively communicated this decision to the, to the government of Japan. So this was uh, financed by a JICA loan. And this was the first decision that they made that um, went against Japanese interests. The second was this famous um, Eastern Container Terminal Port Project issue. So Sri Lanka was part of a tripartite agreement between the Adani Group in India, JICA, and the Sri Lanka Ports Authority to develop the Eastern Contain Container Terminal Project. At the time that the government did this, they were seeking a $400 million currency swap from India under the SARC mechanism. India declined to renew it, saying it was not possible unless Sri Lanka was in an IMF program and that it expects all countries to abide by international commitments. Clearly a jab at Sri Lanka for not taking on the develop, for not pursuing, proceeding with the development of the Eastern Container Terminal Project. Now, eventually the Adani Group signed a deal to develop a different project, the Western Container Terminal Project, but in a sign that the Eastern Container Terminal Project cancellation was done to benefit the interests of China, um, China Harbor Engineering Company later came in and developed, uh, started developing the Eastern Container Terminal Project. Next, I would also argue that Sri Lanka was willing to change its policies to benefit Chinese interests um, at the expense of alienating key partners. So the most prominent example of this is the debate over the Colombo Port Economic Commission Act, which created the Colombo Port City. So here, and I would argue that this is similar to the CPEC authority in Pakistan, is that it created a governing committee that was not answerable to parliament. And this, this became wrapped up in, in hypernationalism again, with the opposition parties believe, saying that this violated Sri Lanka's sovereignty. Ultimately, the, the Supreme Court ruled that some of the clauses were unconstitutional and the bill was amended so that a majority of the commissioners are from Sri Lanka. But this commission has the power to make rules, create business exemptions related to tax, taxes, customs, etc. So why did Sri Lanka do, do this? Um, and I, this is the third mistake that they made, um, is that they believed that help from China would come, but I, I would argue they did not read the geopolitical landscape properly. So why did Sri Lanka make these decisions? It desperately needed foreign exchange inflows, and there was no desire to approach the IMF for a full program, even though opposition, parliament, opposition members in parliament, India, international sovereign bond holders, everyone believed that this was the need of the hour. Um, I would say that Sri Lanka believed that China would come to its help again, especially given the close relationship between the Rajapaksas and the, and the Chinese government. However, I think this is a fundamental misreading of the global economic situation, whereas China is willing to extend refinancing or extend more loans, but was not willing to engage in a restructuring of loans, which is what Sri Lanka needed. And I would point this would be I would argue that they would that Sri Lanka should have taken an, a look at what Pakistan did when Prime Minister Imran, when former Prime Minister Imran Khan came to power, how he avoid tried to avoid going to the IMF for a long period of time, went to Turkey, went to Saudi Saudi Arabia, went to China, seeking um, loans or kind of a rollover of the debt. But that help did not come. And ultimately, former Prime Minister Imran Khan went to the IMF for a program with the new finance minister, Hafiz Sheikh. This did not happen in Sri Lanka. And I think this was a fundamental misreading of the situation. And so the last strategic mistake I would say that Sri Lanka made is that it tried to play India and China off each other. It tends to, have, it tends to approach India for something. If it doesn't get it, it goes to China and vice versa. But now what's happened is, is that it succeeded in angering both sides. So with the cancellation of a wide number of Indian projects in Sri Lanka, that caused India to not extend the currency swap and push Sri Lanka to go towards the IMF. More recently, Sri Lanka has been looking for a, a rollover of the debt from China or kind of a debt restructuring from China, but China has been playing hardball with them because 
in December 2020, um, the Chinese ambassador visited Jaffna, uh, some islands near Jaffna to inaugurate some renewable energy projects. Under pressure from India, those projects were canceled. And in March, 2022, India signed a deal with Sri Lanka to develop those um, renewable energy projects. So again, this is an example of how Sh Sri Lanka has failed to kind of take advantage of the, of the growing India-China rivalry, and at the same time has managed to alienate both sides. And so now, in the geopolitical landscape, India has been at the forefront of efforts to help Sri Lanka, extending bilateral loans um, and lines of credit to Sri Lanka for it to help navigate this crisis. And at the same time, there hasn't been the same level of motivation from the Chinese government, which um, the Chinese ambassador to Sri Lanka initially said that um, we regret um, Sri Lanka has had to go to the IMF, has defaulted on its debt and has had to go to the IMF. At the time, it was seen as playing hardball for, in retaliation for the cancellation of projects. And now China is willing to play a more constructive role. But Sri Lanka has moved very close to the India camp now and is very heavily reliant on kind of the bilateral aid from India and the strategic aid from India to navigate this current crisis. India has been Sri Lanka's champion at the IMF, has been pushing for um, Sri Lanka to be classified as a low income country so that it can access more multilateral aid, but it remains to be seen if that gamble will pay off. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Akil, for presenting the overall strategic and political aspect of the situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, I now invite Ms. Rehana Taufik for uh, her take on the causes of Sri Lankan economic crisis and what led to the situation there in Sri Lanka. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Neelam and the Institute for, of uh, Strategic Studies, Islamabad, for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm grateful to be here and to talk about Sri Lanka's situation, although it is rather sad uh, that we must do so uh, to talk about Sri Lanka as a cautionary tale. Uh, rather than a story of success. Um, so looking at Sri Lanka's uh, economic crisis and how it unfolded, uh, in my, I, I think you should look at it in two, um, two separate buckets. Uh, so one is the long-term economic problems, the long-term structural problems that Sri Lanka has failed to address. Uh, and secondly, the uh, series of uh, economic decisions that was taken uh, over the course of the past two years uh, during the pandemic uh, and um, uh, immediately after. So if we talk about the over, you know, talk, talk about the long-term structural problems. Uh, we can trace Sri Lanka's uh, debt problem to uh, what we call the twin deficits, right? Sri Lanka has um, both a budget deficit and a current account deficit. And uh, uh, if we take the budget deficit, for example, since the 1950s, uh, except for two years, Sri Lanka has run a, a fiscal deficit. Um, so naturally, when you, you know, you spend... Uh, more than you earn, you obviously have to borrow. Uh, so on the budget deficit uh, side, Sri Lanka's um, GDP growth, uh, particularly post-war, has been uh, fueled quite heavily with uh, government expenditure on infrastructure projects uh, and other development programs, uh, most of which was funded through, um, through debt. Um, uh, post-war, we did see um, an exponential growth in the fiscal deficits as well. Um, so after 2007, uh, Sri Lanka began relying quite extensively on uh, international sovereign bonds to fund uh, its uh, fund both these deficits. And uh, so with ISBs, uh, international sovereign bonds, the advantage is that, uh, you know, it comes in a lump sum. And uh, so it's easy for a government to raise uh, finances when it, whenever it needs. And also, uh, th there's not much scrutiny and not, my, not many questions uh, asked about what you're going to spend it on, how are you going to spend it, uh, unlike uh, with other like concessional lending and project-based loans. Um, the, the, the unfortunate thing is that most of these infrastructure projects that Sri Lanka uh, spent these uh, debt-financed uh, you know, uh, loans on was were mainly white elephant projects, which did not uh, yield uh, a lot of return for uh, the Sri Lankan citizens, right? Uh, and then, 
over time, uh, each, almost all successive governments have also um, opted to give public sector jobs more and more because it increases their popularity. So, um, uh, you know, over time, uh, the salary and pensions obligations of the government has grown very significantly. Um, and now I think in 2020, uh, it spent about 70% of government revenue on salary and pension obligations. Um, so at present, Sri Lanka has about 1.5 million public sector workers, including the military. Uh, and that makes up about 17 to 18% of the total uh, labor force in the country. So taxation is uh, something that's unpopular, I think, in, in all countries, but uh, including in Sri Lanka. So obviously successive governments did not want to jeopardize their popularity by raising taxes. So what they did was um, they opted to uh, borrow. Uh, to finance these deficits. Uh, so Sri Lanka has graduated from um, a lower middle income country to an upper middle income country along the way. Um, but if you take a look at Sri Lanka's tax to GDP ratio, it has fallen very significantly uh, over time. So in 1990, uh, when Sri Lanka had, had a per capita income of about uh, $450, Sri Lanka's tax ratio was about uh, 90%. But in 2021, when Sri Lanka has a per capita income of about $3,800, our tax, uh, tax to GDP ratio is 7.7%. It's the lowest it has ever been uh, in post-independence uh, Sri Lanka. So on the current account side, there's also uh, a spate of structural issues that successive governments have failed to address uh, you know, in its entirety over time. Uh, Government, uh, Sri Lankan governments have oscillated between, uh, you know, outward facing, uh, sorry, outward looking export oriented policies and uh, inward looking import substitution policies. But there's never been a long term consistent policy, trade policy for Sri Lanka to get behind on. Um, so at the moment, Sri Lanka is a highly protectionist economy. We levy import tariffs, uh, a very complicated tariff structure uh, to protect domestic industries and interests. And, uh, you know, such measures have inevitably led to a total misallocation of resources to highly protected industries. Um, so the result of this is that Sri Lanka has uh, absolutely failed to uh, diversify its merchandise export basket uh, over the uh, several decades since liberalization. Um, it's, uh, we, we still rely quite heavily on apparel and tea. Um, and, you know, despite being uh, party to several bilateral free trade agreements, uh, several regional uh, trade agreements, and even benefiting from uh, the US and the EU uh, generalized scheme of preferences programs, Sri Lanka has, uh, you know, uh, Sri Lanka's export performance has been rather uh, lackluster. Um, and in fact, Sri Lanka's openness to trade, which measures the merchandise trade as a percentage of GDP, has fallen significantly since the 1990s, uh, which was when um, uh, the country, you know, properly liberalized itself for the first time. Um, so trade policy in itself is highly bureaucratized and it's very cumbersome to set up uh, an import or an export oriented business in the country. Um, in terms of foreign investments post-war, Sri Lanka has failed uh, to attract a lot of foreign investment except in large construction projects. Um, again, we can attribute this to the policy failures. For example, there are very high uh, investment thresholds, so uh, which kind of keeps away the smaller and medium foreign investors from coming into the country. Uh, tourism has grown organically over uh, the time since the war ended, uh, but there haven't really been any concerted efforts to uh, develop tourism to benefit uh, a wider range of communities, uh, you know, in different geographic areas uh, in the country. Um, the IT industry, which has a huge potential to be a dollar earning powerhouse uh, for Sri Lanka, uh, he's also, you know, suffering because Sri Lanka has a rather backward and uh, resource short uh, education system. So education, uh, educating children in, uh, you know, with, uh, made to bring them up to skill, uh, skill them up to, you know, be actually employable in an IT industry is very difficult. Uh, through the schooling and the vocational training uh, system in the country. 
So now these are the long-term problems, but I'll take you, I'll walk you through uh, what happened over the course of the past two years. Um, uh, so uh, if we go back to October 2018, when the constitutional crisis occurred in Sri Lanka, um, the, the, the incumbent president at the si time uh, overnight decided to appoint uh, Mahinda Rajapaksha as the PM, who was uh, the PM in Sri Lanka just uh, last week. Um, and there was a there was a new government for 52 days, and there was um, a lot of uh, there was total political instability. And finally, the Supreme Court ruled that it was not uh, you know it was not legal to oust uh, the sitting prime minister. Um, so immediately after this, uh, in April 2019, Sri Lanka uh, underwent the uh, 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 East bombing attacks. And uh, once again, Sri Lanka was in a highly vulnerable situation. Uh, so around October 2018, actually, Sri Lanka's uh, sovereign uh, ratings were downgraded for the first time uh, in two years. So um, uh, that was that was where it kind of started. And um, because of the, the twin deficit problem that I spoke about before, uh, the issue of Sri Lanka's debt sustainability has been boiling in the background, like Akhil said. Um, you know, it's not, it's been there for several years. IMF has been raising this point uh, for several years in the uh, periodic reports of Sri Lanka. But the real catalytical um, decision that sort of pushed Sri Lanka over the edge was the tax cuts of 2019. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it was done mainly to solidify the, the pre President Gotabaya's uh, uh, recent uh, presidential victory. And it was something he had promised in his manifesto uh, as well, that he will be uh, cutting um, taxes. Um, uh, you know, on the, in the background of uh, immediately after that, we went into the COVID pandemic situation and then tourism and export re uh, revenue was also uh, affected. Um, so once the government decided to uh, abandon this fiscal consolidation route by cutting taxes, uh, Sri Lanka was downgraded in the international finance uh, markets, which is what it used to rely on to roll over debt and also to finance its deficits. Um, Sri Lanka was in an IMF program uh, from 2016 to 2019, but it was ended prematurely because the government decided uh, to abandon this path of fiscal consolidation. So obviously at this point, the best decision would have been to go back to the IMF and get help to restructure the loans, especially because, um, you know, none of us knew how long COVID was, was going to last. It was, in, it was obvious that it wasn't going to go away immediately. And what several experts were saying is that it's going to last at least uh, two years. Um, but unfortunately, the Rajpaksha administration opted to keep repaying debts um, with the dwindling foreign reserves. So we had about, in 2019, that was about $7.5 billion in uh, revenue. Uh, sorry, in foreign uh, foreign reserves, um, and then they import uh, they they uh, they put several import restrictions in place as well to try to save uh, on import expenditure, and then also uh, you know several inflated attempts at trying to earn forex through tourism bubbles, etc. So the decision uh, economic decision making process was highly uh, you know dysfunctional. Uh, so this series of bad decisions. Uh, you know, contributed to uh, really sealing Sri Lanka's fate uh, um, where it is now. So um, there were also other decisions like uh, printing money excessively. Uh, there was a low interest rate uh, regime in place. So there was a lot of excess demand being created because uh, and a lot of demand for imports as well from all of this new money coming into, uh, into circulation. Um, uh, you know, now we see that the rupee is plummeting. It's uh, it's at about 360 rupees uh, for, per, per dollar. And inflation is actually, uh, most recent statistics, it's at 30%. Uh, and, and food inflation is almost close to 50%. Um, so the government also, uh, along the way, uh, in 2021, decided to impose a fixed exchange rate of about 205 or 210 rupees per dollar, which was uh, which absolutely failed to reflect the real real market uh, value of the dollar, right? Um, 
uh, in the black market, it was going for about 250, 260, 270 uh, on the dollar. So what this ended up doing is that uh, migrant workers who, uh, you know, who would normally remit their earnings uh, uh, to families through formal banking systems, they opted to go to the black market or the gray market instead because they were getting a better rate. Um, and exporters who normally remit their earnings decided not to, you know, if if they can, they'll keep the money out. If they, if they, you know, I only bring in what Sri Lanka absolutely needs. Uh, so this uh, exchange rate, uh, fixed exchange rate regime that the central bank followed actually ended up uh, costing us about one point five uh, billion dollars in worker remittances in twenty twenty one alone. And uh, now the rate is being. Uh, it's, it's uh, now a lot higher, the official rate. There was a, a period where it was free falling, but now the central bank has stepped in with uh, new measures to try to control the, the, the uh, volatility. Um, we are starting to see worker remittances pick up slightly, but it's still not at levels that it used to be uh, in uh, 2000, uh, 2020. Um, so there was a huge forex shortage in, in the country and importers were struggling to uh, you know, open letters of credit. Uh, they couldn't find the dollars to import, um, you know, and instead of correcting this problem, but the central bank, you know, by phasing out a flexible exchange rate a lot sooner, the central bank governor, um, who is a, a, a political appointee, uh, uh, you know, thought he'll follow a more sort of a moral suasion kind of tactic and strong arm tactic. So they went and they, uh, they were busting into uh, exchange uh, Exchange rate, exchange providers, and you know, it was it was a it was a uh, it was a situation like that. So obviously, this 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 fixed uh, rate failed miserably because you know you obviously can't fool the market. Uh, you can't offer a rate which is uh, you know 50, 60 percent lower than the actual rate and actually try to get money into the system. Um, so the government needed about four or five billion dollars extra to pay back just to pay back its loans. Uh, but it was not getting any getting much forex inflows. So what it did was it ended up dipping into reserves uh, and to seeking short term solutions like currency swaps uh, with uh, China, with India, um, and then it was running on a lot of uh, false bravado, in my opinion. Um, the the policy this policy of seeking uh, currency swaps and also paying you know. Uh, Willingly running down the reserves to pay debts was also exercised without caution. And now we have run into a situation where I think the prime minister just yesterday said that the, um, uh, the government can't even scrape together $1 million, right? That's how bad the situation is. Like the barrel is, is totally empty. Um, so these bad decisions were topped up with even more bad decisions. Uh, one example is the organic agricultural push. I think everyone has spoken about why it's a bad decision. Um, I think this was done to save on importer costs because Sri Lanka spends uh, a lot of import uh, dollars on fertilizer uh, imports. So um, in the end, we ended up jeopardizing our farmers, and now we are facing, in, on top of that, we are also facing a food uh, security crisis, and we now have to rely even more on uh, imports to actually meet our food uh, security needs. Um, so the path that we were heading down was pretty obvious. It was obvious that the government had to go to IMF at some point, but as Akhil said, uh, uh, several bad decisions, um, strategically bad decisions were made. And there was a lot of false bravado. The uh, central bank governor and the, the president, the prime minister, the finance minister were all adamant that we will get out of this. We will solve this problem somehow. So now we have gone to the IMF. Uh, situation is really bad. Uh, the rupee has depreciated by 60% against the dollar. Uh, inflation is close to 30%. Food inflation is uh, over 45%. And I suspect it will increase even more. Uh, there are shortages in everything, fuel, gas, milk, medicine, raw materials. Uh, there is a political crisis. People uh, are on the streets demanding that the government go home, go uh, resign. Uh, people are dying in queues. Uh, there are shortages in, in essential medicines, even for cancer patients. Um, you know, last week we had a different prime minister. Now we have a new prime minister. Uh, there are, there's no money in the, in the reserves and other, you know, there are fuel and gas tankers at the port, which we can't clear because there's no money. 
uh, and honestly, like help, help cannot come any sooner. The situation is really bad. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hanna, for uh, highlighting some of the structural issues of Sri Lankan's economy and also emphasizing on the strategic and economic bad decisions that were uh, that led to the crisis uh, in Sri Lanka. So just based on these two discussions, I now invite uh, Mr. Shah Rukh Vani for his take on the state of Pakistan's economy and what you see the situation at the moment is, and do you see a situation like this will happen if good decisions are not taken in time? Thank you very much. Uh, first of, for one, thank you very much to Akhil and Rehana for this very insightful uh, um, insights into what's uh, what's happening in Sri Lanka and the causes behind it. And Dr. Neela Mirabasta Choudhury for the invite. I will keep it fairly brief. I have I will say three things about the current crisis and three things uh, which I've just jotted down listening to uh, uh, Akhil and Rihanna on what kind of things we can probably learn from it. Um, first of all, very similar to what Rihanna was saying, Pakistan's current crisis we are in is a consequence of our twin twin deficit problem. It's not something which has happened overnight. It's a decades long challenge Pakistan faces. It's something, it's basically the cause why Pakistan goes to the International Monetary Fund every three years. And that effectively is that Pakistan doesn't export enough. So it doesn't earn enough dollars to pay for its imports. It's not because Pakistan imports a lot. Pakistan imports about the average in its income group. It just doesn't export enough. Uh, the second thing is Pakistan doesn't tax enough to cover government spending. In this particular case, the former, not having enough dollar is a more urgent concern because domestic debt, domestic budget deficit can be financed through debt. Uh, but the foreign one, it's much harder to raise dollars than it is, to, you can always uh, borrow from uh, banks domestically. So now uh, on not being able to export enough is again, results of a structural issue that Pakistani firms are simply not competitive enough to, uh, to go into the international market, into the national, value chains and uh, be able to compete with firms for, let's say, Vietnam or Bangladesh or elsewhere. And we can unpack that a bit. And that's in part because Pakistan has lagged in building up labor productivity over the years. It has also set up a very, very bad incentive structure within the economy where capital moves into non-tradable uh, uh, sectors. Uh, so there's a sort of misallocation of resources. Uh, for instance, uh, repeated schemes which provide incentivized investment in real estate as, a, as an example of how sort of capital moves away from building manufacturing and tradable capacity, which could uh, sell products or services abroad and make uh, earn dollars, but goes into increasing con consumption domestically uh, because of very high invested interest or just an sort of easier way of generating quick growth. Um, it's also then tied to various other governance challenges Pakistan faces because you need to have a sort of investment in education, technology adaptation, and all of that stuff in order for your firms to be to go abroad and compete. And another added dimension to that is energy, which is another sort of sector of Pakistan which has been uh, in a sort of long term crisis, um, despite now having enough sort of capacity. Uh, to generate enough electricity, but sort of circular debt and other challenges uh, around transmission add to that um, continuing challenge. Um, so that's the reason why Pakistan sort of struggles broadly to export. And that's why we don't have enough, enough dollars. And that's why we have to go repeatedly uh, uh, for international uh, sort of inflow, like through either raising foreign debt or going to the IMF and uh, getting to, going into the sort of, uh, IMF programs. Um, um, the second, uh, but less sort of an urgent problem in Pakistan right now is also the budget deficit, which ha which has been, which is going to be quite high this year, in very large consequence of the petroleum subsidies which were provided by the last administration. Um, a consequence of that uh, is going to be that the government will have to borrow from banks uh, at a fairly high interest rate. Uh, and that will also crowd out very likely private investment as it did in previous years. Um, and that again is because Pakistan's government doesn't tax as much as it should, it's about 10, 11% of GDP. It has re remarkable amounts of subsidies within the, uh, and sort of exemptions within the current tax code. It doesn't improve enforcement. The entire tax system is basically built around the easiest way you can generate money. So it taxes imports a lot, which also has a consequence of making exports uncompetitive. 
it, and also taxes through withholding and uh, other means of sort of indirect taxes, which are highly regressive. So it doesn't really build sort of that income tax net, but also leaves up very significant chunks of the economy, including agriculture income and uh, urban land untaxed completely. So because of all of those not being able to sort of expand that and fix that, that also has caused uh, a sort of recurring budget deficit. This, In this case, it's significantly made worse by the fact that we provide about 75 billion rupees every fortnight as a fuel subsidy, which is continues to increase given global oil prices. So that has been that's that's ridiculous amounts of money, and that's going to uh, balloon subsidy uh, well, it's quite significantly, and also causes an increase in external deficit, trade deficit, because oil you have to import, uh, and you have to pay that in dollars while you're selling it in subsidized levels of rupees. So uh, it's a whole sort of bad policy decisions, which and underlying structural issues, which have compounded together into uh, making the twin deficit problem a lot worse right now. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing, and which is in part a cause of it, uh, is the political uncertainty Pakistan faces right now. And that that seems to make certain decisions which a lot of people know which have to happen quite unfeasible or uh, difficult to happen because the political climate is so polarized and complex for different actors to navigate. Um, and it's not because they don't know, it's the finance minister knows what has to happen, but because they, they are struggling to build a political coalition to take those really difficult decisions because they might not have enough political capital in place. Uh, and that's and the, and the prime example of that is the fuel subsidy, which there's a, um, I've never, economists don't have very little consensus usually, but in this case, Pakistani economists, almost everyone I've talked to has a complete consensus that this has to go. Uh, it's completely unacceptable. And the, the current finance minister also agreed uh, with all of us until a few weeks ago. Um, but again, that decision is, has complete political um, implication and has to have a political ownership before it can be taken. But that's the second dimension and that might get worse over time depending on how politics in Pakistan evolves. And the third thing which we don't really talk about and it might uh, sort of um, uh, make this a, a lot worse uh, is the global stresses emerging economies are facing right now. Um, that includes, there's a Fed uh, rate hikes in, in, in the US, which makes raising debt much more harder because capital flies to America to benefit from that higher interest rate. Uh, the growth in China uh, is we're still uncertain about if that's, if there are going to be repeated lockdowns, if that's going to slow down, that also generates a global lag in growth because China is such a consequential actor when it comes to the global trade. Uh, fuel prices continue to increase, uh, which in specific has a problem for Pakistan because we are a fuel importing nation. Uh, and uh, also that might uh, reverse a bit if growth in China and there are lockdowns there. So there is a relationship there. And the fourth thing is the Ukraine-Russia crisis, which has a very specific impact on beet procurement and food, uh, global food prices, food prices. And Pakistan also imports beet uh, and imports a lot of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia. So it's going to, and if, even if it doesn't, the global market is, going, is becoming much more expensive. Uh, so that's going to have a very, uh, more drastic impact. So all of that is makes the global condition uh, really, really bad. So when does Pakistan go and assuming it goes into an IMF program and is able to go and raise private debt through your bonds or whatever, it's going to be much harder uh, than it was a few years ago to raise that debt. So that, that's an added level layer of complexion uh, in the current crisis. So uh, based on that and the, uh, and the uh, comments that the speakers have given, uh, uh, I think there are sort of three things which we can uh, extract from what Sri Lanka is going and also based on our own experiences, which provide lessons for us perhaps. First, and I think this is this is not economics, but I think there's a, there's a need for the leadership to be a bit honest about it. If you ignore problems, if you ignore a crisis, it doesn't really go away. Uh, and that seems to be something which happens a lot. And in Pakistan right now, I'm sort of seeing early stages of that. Uh, you, you need to own up, I think, the political leadership to be direct and honest with people where they stand, rather than providing sort of uh, either false hopes or trying to pretend that the crisis doesn't exist and trying to navigate it through sort of short-term measures and things like that. Uh, the second thing is that Pakistan, uh, we need to take certain tough stabilization decisions and that uh, and that's going to put your cost, but has to happen. And what um, um, Rehana and Akhil were saying in Sri Lanka's case, we, they had to go to the IMF and it was quite certain, quite clear that 
that should have happened earlier. And in Pakistan, that's largely it. We are today or tomorrow starting the negotiations with the IMF again, but that might not happen unless fuel subsidies are reduced if there's a roadmap in place. So th these are difficult decisions to take, especially because they cost a lot of political capital for the current, current leadership. But the, the alternative of sort of this crisis ballooning and uh, sort of moving towards something where we can't pay for imports and can't service our debt and move into a default-like situation will be much, much worse. And uh, I was having a conversation the other day and uh, with some uh, uh, some journalist, and it's like the concept, if you think inflation is gonna rise when you increase the price of fuel, and inflation will also quite drastically rise when you when you move into a default-like situation. So there is, there is, it's very, it's very hard to navigate this politically, but it has to be done because the consequence and the counterfactual is very hard. It will be much more uh, harder for the country. We will have much more long-term uh, sort of implications of the country's human capital and growth prospects. And the third thing I will say is, and this is something uh, we often don't do here in Pakistan, uh, is that we tend to go from one firefight into another because we have such repeated and such intense macroeconomic crisis every three, four years. We do need to focus on the underlying structural issues. Uh, the fact that we don't export enough, the fact that we don't tax enough is a consequence of deeper issues in our economy and our economic policy management. And that has to be addressed. And I understand that it's not usually the top of the agenda because there's a lot of short-term measures which have to be taken and everyone focuses on that. And then, then we get one year of sort of my mediocre growth and then we end up overheating the economy and going back into a crisis. But we need to, uh, at some point, focus on these issues. So we need to focus on misallocation in the economy. We need to focus on what kind of incentive structure the government's policies are creating for firms. Why are firms not exporting enough? But why are they not competitive enough? Are these because of input factors or incentives? So what's the, what's the reason behind it? And there's a lot of uh, things which sort of government can focus on and sequence growth and uh, sort of uh, reforms in those areas. And the same thing goes around taxes too. It's like, how can we expand that tax base to make it more progressive? That the government doesn't have to borrow uh, so much from private banks and crowd out all the sort of uh, private sector borrowing that uh, the banks can make. Uh, um, so all of that is going to, uh, should be a focus now uh, and hopefully not letting this crisis go to waste. On that, there are two things specifically. There's one is how do you get productivity levels up in, in Pakistan? And that's going to be really should be a really important concern. And the second is how to get the decision making structures to improve, and they're both intertwined. But uh, uh, making gains on that so that the next crisis, either we are able to not go into another macroeconomic crisis three years down the line, or if we do go into it or we are, have similar crisis, we're in a much better position because we have made some sort of structural improvements in the uh, in Pakistan's economy. So I will stop here and uh, I'll hand it over back to. Uh, Host. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shahrukh, for identifying or uh, precisely uh, highlighting the issues that plague the economy and what are, what are the steps that are needed to be taken. So now I uh, invite uh, Mr. Imran for his take on the subject. Thank you very much uh, for uh, having me. I appreciate Institute of Strategic Studies uh, time the discussion on a very important uh, topic that indeed has some uh, lessons for Pakistan as well, as well as the other South Asian countries. Uh, I'm not an uh, economic expert, but I would like to highlight some uh, underlying factors that aggravated uh, the crisis in Sri Lanka and try to draw some important lessons for Pakistan. So uh, there are many perspectives uh, to trace the reasons behind the Sri Lankan economic crisis. For instance, huge borrowings uh, from China, Japan, COVID-19 and sharp decline in tourism uh, and the organic uh, agriculture experiment to name a few. But the way I look at the Sri Lankan economic crisis is slightly different. Uh, for me, it was a failure of uh, Sri Lanka's balancing policy towards the US, India and the China. So why Colombo failed uh, in doing so, I will discuss shortly. And second most noticeable reason of economic failure was China's response. And it was not uh, overwhelming as it was, as it was uh, expected during the crisis. These two factors have turned the economic uh, crisis into severe uh, uh, political and economic turmoil in the country. Uh, 
So now the question arises: There have been ups and downs uh, in the past, where Sri Lanka was uh, uh, was failed to balance its policy towards China, India, and the US. But it did not result in the worst economic crisis. But why this time? Here we need to understand the global dynamics, as mentioned earlier by the panelists. The global tide against Ch uh, Russia and China's response to that crisis. After COVID-19, it was the Ukrainian crisis and the polarization of them have hit the economies of small countries of South Asia very hard. Countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, whose economies either directly or indirectly are in the complete interdependence uh, with major players of today's polarized world. So uh, it, uh, again, uh, in, in, in the whole scenario, India's role has been crucial and that needs to be understood. As New Delhi was not only uh, able to keep its economic economy protected from the heat of the rising polarization, but also textfully diverted it to other countries of South Asia that were extremely vulnerable to the polarization. And Sri Lanka was one of them that became the easy target. As I said earlier, that Sri Lanka was struggling for the, for the last two years for smooth economic sale, but the global tie today uh, against Russia and the US over-responsive behavior provided New Delhi an opportunity to regain its traditional influence that has largely been marginalized by the Rajapaksa regime. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa was reluctant to go to the IMF and wanted to uh, and wanted some homegrown a uh, homegrown uh, solution to the crisis. As Godabaya Rajapaksa, his younger brother, after coming to power, reduced taxes and abolished several taxes, and very importantly, did. Uh, not go, uh, did not um, go ahead with the law that uh, proposed the autonomy of the central bank, uh, which was one of the demands that IMF uh, strongly uh, recommended. But the balancing approach started collapsing when India started encouraging Mahinda Rajapaksa to go to go uh, to IMF. Uh, when the economic assistance from New Delhi started uh, pouring in, uh, that was around three billion dollar. Uh, and the replacement of Mahinda Rajapaksa with Ranil Vikram Singh took place, who is pro West, uh, who is said to be pro West and also pro Indian and staunch support of the free market. It became easy for India to install its game plan more effectively. And it is interesting to note that the Ranil Vikram, uh, Vikram Singh, uh, whose party, United National Party, UNB, has only one seat in the parliament, uh, but he was able to get the support. To become the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. So amid rising protest and strong opposition to Rajapaksa and China nexus, China took a back seat. And China believed that India's move had United States backing and China does not want an open confrontation in the island. Uh, this message was clear when uh, Jay Shankar visited Colombo, uh, where in a senior United States official also joined in that is minimizing reliance on China. Both India and the United States promised to support Colombo's effort to diversify its sources uh, of credit and in, in investment to salvage its economy. And India's backroom planning is continued to bear fruits for both countries as Rohan Gonaratna, Director General of the Sri Lankan Institute, of national security studies said that Sri Lanka's strategic pendulum is shifting away from China towards India and the United States. So India and the United States are trying to regain their strategic importance that have largely been slashed after the Galwan Valley incident, incident for India and United States withdrawal from office. Second argument that I uh, made was the absence of overwhelming response of China during the recent uh, economic crisis. The question arises why China did not respond uh, to Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka crisis more effectively uh, as it had the option to do that. Gotabaya Rajapaksa uh, faced lots of criticism at home as he could not able to get the required benefit from China as he was very close to China. Here is the lesson not only for Sri Lanka, but also for Pakistan, that both countries fail to understand the Chinese behavior, its strategic thoughts, and limitation to overwhelming response, especially in a crisis of a global nature. Uh, as China want, wants to rise, but rise peacefully. Uh, 
And secondly, the overvaluing response in the shape of Marshall Plan, like for Colombo, could be counterproductive and have far reaching consequences for Chinese long term investment, like the PRI. So, China's holding back uh, actually provided room for India to maneuver, as we can see, Ranil Vikram Singh has taken a prime minister seat, who is said to have support from New Delhi. A lot of research has been done on economic impact of Ukrainian crisis on Sri Lanka's. Uh, uh, on Sri Lanka, like the rising oil prices, impact on export uh, of tea, garment, and several uh, items, impact on uh, tourism. But the research on the backroom planning of India is missing, that how India is involved in political and economic engineering to regain its, its traditional influence in the island while exploiting the global polarization. And this very move of India caused the island's balancing failure. Apart from underlying uh, factors, the failure of economic crisis in Colombo is uncertain, as the credibility of the current government is questionable. This is not, there is no guarantee that the next political setup in Sri Lanka uh, uphold the IMF deal. There, there is a history behind uh, as Sri Lanka abandoned seven out of 16 IMF programs. So in the given scenario, the collapse would be beyond redemption. So here lessons, here also lessons for Pakistan as the current government needs care for deliberation on the IMF program, especially the sustainability factor. Otherwise the consequences uh, would be beyond imagination. So another lesson for Pakistan is a balancing foreign policy approach, especially at the time when there is a crisis of a global nature since there is an indirect clash between the West and Russia, countries like Pakistan, whose economy is under the complex interdependence, could uh, face uh, the economic troubles when taking sides. And the third and the most uh, important lesson is to have deep understanding of Chinese behavior, strategy, and limitation to support of South Asian countries during the crisis. In other words, a realistic calculation needs to be worked out for economic gains. Geo-economic uh, strategy cannot be made in isolation or heavily relying on one or few countries. Uh, for Pakistan, for countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bangladesh, they need a careful balancing approach since they are extremely vulnerable as long as India continues to play on the both sides of the conflict. So uh, last but not the least, uh, uh, the current government in Pakistan do not mislead the people of Pakistan about the economic crisis. So there is a dire need to take into the people of Pakistan into confidence. And this was the mistake that Raja Paksa, Raja Paksa did uh, uh, make. Uh, initially, he, was, uh, he misled the nation about the economic, impending economic crisis. So I will stop here. If there are any questions, I'd be uh, more welcome. To thank you. Uh, thank you, Imran, for highlighting the global um, dynamics uh, which had led to the situation in uh, Sri Lanka and what Pakistan needs to learn from there. So uh, uh, we had a very wonderful discussion and uh, from our um, um, speakers. Uh, now the floor is open for question and answer session. Uh, if you have any of the questions, you can please uh, name the speaker to whom you want to ask the question. Ambassador Chaudhary, if you have any question or comment to add. Yeah, I will. I will. Uh, I must say that it was a fascinating discussion. Everyone spoke uh, very clearly and, and uh, cogently. And I think uh, uh, the very first speaker, uh, I must say, Akhil Barry, you were brilliant in articulating in such uh, you know brevity um, the what led to this crisis and all while you were speaking and while the others were also speaking i was constantly relating it to uh, some of the issues that pakistan is now facing and uh, i must say that uh, uh, the last the, the very last comment by imran sardar uh, touched me the most because he he put his finger on the on the raw nerve, which is 
that people of Pakistan must be taken into confidence on the gravity of the economic situation. I think if we, if uh, if the our leadership is not honest with people and, and keeps finding subsidies and other tricks to just stay afloat, uh, that may not help. If there are tough decisions to be taken, so be it. Um, another point <clears throat> that was made, I think, also by uh, by Mr. Vani and others was that we we got to understand uh, the geopolitics of uh, of the region and we must although pakistan maintains very good ties with china pakistan also wants to have good relations with uh, with us and i just spoke gave a comment to ptv because our foreign minister is flying off to us and they wanted my comment quickly uh, uh, while having balanced relations this is fine but I think uh, we need to be highly pragmatic uh, and realistic on what the US or China could offer to us in terms of uh, rescuing us from. Uh, we should also not depend on Saudi Arabia or others uh, and fix the fundamentals, the, the, the structural issues, the systemic issues. Um, and that can only be done if our leadership uh, takes one clear decision that they will bring everything uh, to the uh, knowledge of the people and let and prepare the people to take those tough decisions. Because if you don't take those tough decisions now, like Sri Lanka, you would have to do them a, cup, a couple of uh, years or perhaps even months later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from the audience, if there's any question. Great. Okay, there's one question from the audience here. Do you think uh, literacy has anything to do with economy? Can an educated society save its uh, skin from economic meltdown? If yes, then the Sri Lankan fell into the, despite 97 literacy rate. If not, then why the world is emphasizing on education? That's a question to uh, Mr. Akil. Um, sure. I mean, I think, I think the bigger question is in Sri Lanka, as, as Rihanna said, Sri Lanka was an upper middle income country, um, and it was on the right path of development. Um, it had, it was in a position where it was starting to export more, but unfortunately, a series of external shocks has also helped kind of push Sri Lanka to where it is. So when you combine bad policy making decisions as Rehana uh, spoke about, along with a wide variety of external shocks. So you had the Easter bombing attacks. Um, you, sorry, you had the constitutional crisis. You had the Easter bombing attacks, which um, diluted tourism. Then you had um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now you've got the Russia-Ukraine crisis um, that has pushed commodity prices up. So an educated workforce, I don't think, um, would have been able to deal with this situation in a different way. I mean, it's. I think what's happened more is bad politics and policies. And continuing what Imran said and what Ambassador Chaudhary said, there was a fundamental um, view within the government to not be honest with the situ with the citizens of the country about just how bad the situation was. And there was an unwillingness to recognize that Sri Lanka did need to go to the IMF, and that would kind of, that would give um, confidence to international creditors. I remember in January 2022, the former central bank governor was gloating on Twitter about the fact that Sri Lanka repaid its bond, its international sovereign bond in January 2022, saying to everyone who doubted us, this is, um, um, this is proof that we will never default and that we will always pay our debt. January 2022 was never going to be the problem. It was always going to be the July 2022 international sovereign bond that was maturing. And so I, um, the hubris of the government helped push it into this crisis, not the fact that Sri Lanka has an educated workforce, if I understood the question correctly. Okay, thank you. There's a question to uh, Ms. Rehana. Uh, how do you see the international community and particularly the democratic West uh, 
coming forth to help avoid further economic turmoil in Sri Lanka? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so if you take uh, over the course of the past year and a half, we did get uh, we we didn't get a lot of support from uh, the West. We got a lot more support from India, uh, which was um, the biggest source of credit lines and currency swaps and other um, arrangements. Uh, and it was actually them who pushed us uh, to go to the IMF eventually, uh, because we had uh, they had given us two deferments on. Um, one um, one repayment, and they said we can't do this again unless you go to the IMF. Um, so until uh, the last week of March, the government maintained that we will not be going to the IMF. But then, um, you know, at the eleventh hour, that's when we uh, decided to go. Um, I think the the political crisis and the instability around uh, or the faith in the Rajapaksha government is now uh, completely uh, decimated. Uh, the people don't have a lot of faith in them. Uh, but the install uh, installing uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe was, uh, I guess you could see it as a positive move in terms of uh, the fact that he does have good uh, foreign relations and good relations with. Um, with India and with China and with uh, particularly the West. Uh, so I think almost immediately after he was announced as the prime minister, uh, the US ambassador in Sri Lanka tweeted that they would be going into discussions about how uh, the US, uh, for example, could help uh, Sri Lanka uh, sort some kind of bridge financing. Uh, we are yet to see uh, where these discussions will lead. Um, but um, I think the key is uh, having a stable government and a stable uh, uh, stable leaders who the public accepts. I'm not sure if we are there yet um, because, uh, you know, people are still protesting, people are still out there. So I don't know if we will actually have that. But I think um, it all depends on, uh, you know, who the government is uh, and how uh, acceptable and how non-aligned their foreign policy, uh, you know, behavior is. Um, if I just may add to that, um, yeah, please. What I would what I would also add, I mean, in the 2018 constitutional crisis, within it, within uh, Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa taking over as Prime Minister, the Chinese ambassador was the first to to go over and to greet him and to wish him well, um, even though the appointment was later deemed to be illegal. So that kind of shifted the mindset um, and kind of helped reinforce this idea that the Rajapaksas were very pro-China and unwilling to kind of work with any other partners. And that also goes into the decision-making process that I've mentioned before about alienating key partners uh, in the belief that um, China would help it out at, um, and help kind of give the foreign exchange that it needed instead of going to the IMF, which is what the international community believed Sri Lanka needed to do. Thank I'd just you. like to add a um, yeah. comment to the previous one on education. Uh, I mean, yes, Sri Lanka does have a very high literacy rate, uh, but literacy essentially means that we can write and we can read uh, a few sentences. Uh, it does not mean that everybody is able to, uh, you know, intellectually grasp uh, something as big as this economic crisis. Um, and I think... Um, you know, there are several uh, quality and uh, quality issues in our education system. And I think uh, economic and financial literacy um, is not that great in Sri Lanka, which is why, uh, you know, you do find uh, people demanding very populist policies like more government jobs and tax subsidies, uh, sorry, subsidies on uh, uh, full and subsidies on fertilizer, and the governments find it very easy to manipulate uh, public opinion because, uh, you know, they, they, they are in a situation where the system, I mean, the, the, the information is so asymmetric. Uh, so I just want to add that. Okay, thank you. There's another question for uh, Mr. Shah uh, uh, The question is, uh, as uh, what do you think by comparing Pakistan and Sri Lanka economies do you think Pakistan can avoid falling from the same, um, following the same financial mistake or Sri Lanka in practical? I think you have already addressed these, uh, the answer, the, the question that have been put forth. Uh, just add to the question, um, 
as uh, as you already mentioned that some uh, difficult decisions uh, the government of pakistan needs to take which has high political cost at the moment so do you foresee any such political decision that the government uh, will be taking and what options do you think uh, are there available because we are already uh, hearing much about the targeted subsidies and some other interventions that the government needs to do in order to reduce its uh, fiscal budget particularly in terms of its energy subsidies what do you see thank you very much I, before i go into that i want to say about education and growth is that having education or high literacy rate or but also broadly having the right technical skills is really important for delivering growth and building competitive economy um, and that's shown across literature uh, economic evidence throughout the world it doesn't of course prevent economic crises or political crises but it is really important nonetheless uh, for growth but also for other reasons of democracy and such so um, I wouldn't take that, uh, the uh, Sri Lanka's economic crisis, too hard to, to the point that we should sort of stop teaching kids everything and sort of focus on something else. That's not the right approach, and I can't stress this enough. Uh, on, the, on the crisis we face in Pakistan, um, I, I, am, I think, we, of course, we're not to a position where things are going to burn down tomorrow. We do have a bit of import cover. But one thing which I have learned from um, the, from Michael and Rihanna, and also just reading broadly of uh, what, in fact, Michael has shared over the past few weeks around Sri Lanka, is that things can uh, your pre-existing structural weaknesses, uh, if you have those in the economy, they can become much worse and lead to an overall crisis if you don't take the right decisions at the right time. And and that's something uh, we perhaps have to learn in Pakistan, especially right now, is that we can try to defer it. We can try to take the easier politically sort of immediately easier way out of a high discount rate behavior as we call it and try to sort of uh, ignore the problem uh, in, in a way but it doesn't make the problem go away and the structural weaknesses in the economy which are quite uh, quite similar to Sri Lanka uh, uh, and despite the fact that Sri Lanka is a much more wealthy country than Pakistan I think that's what's something to recognize um, uh, around the twin deficits and uh, debt sustainability it will become an issue. So uh, I, I think the options for the government is very clear. Well, my suggestion has been uh, that you uh, reduce, you give either a roadmap uh, for complete uh, elimination of subsidies over fuel. Uh, either you do it in one go, if you can't do it in one go, you give a roadmap on how you're gonna do it. Uh, present that roadmap to the International Monetary Fund, go back into the program, uh, get some, uh, expand your sort of foreign reserves, raise bilateral debt, which I understand that is also contingent upon uh, the IMF resumption, um, and try and sort of stabilize the macroeconomy uh, on one go. Second is provide very clear identification to the market that this is what they're doing, and this is the plan and the roadmap. Uh, so that will also decrease the uh, uncertainty currently Pakistan faces in the market, and that's sort of shown in the stock exchange in the uh, Pakistan, uh, the rupee dollar uh, sort of uh, parity. Um, and then third is then uh, come together and sort of just work on um, sort of solving or sort of moving towards a position where these underlying long running structural issues which cut across political cycles and um, can sort of be now become areas of more focus. And that's uh, something which we need to do. Otherwise, we're going to end up in a crisis in a few years, even with these sort of stabilization measures. On targeted subsidies, I, I think there's a, there's a room to expand. Pakistan has a very good uh, cash transfer program, uh, which was set up uh, in 2009-10, circa, uh, the Benazine Most Program, and the underlying institutional structure, which is called the National Social Economic Registry. That can be expanded, and I think there is a very good case that some of the money which we're giving, so let's say every two weeks we're giving 75 billion rupees to petroleum subsidy, some of that, maybe 5-10 billion rupees, can be added into the uh, base transfers for a certain segment of the population. Now, that won't be enough to cover the uh, inflation. There will be significant inflation increase because of the fuel subsidy, uh, but it will provide some cushion to some people. Any other suggestions around providing targeted fuel subsidies? I, I really, and I've had this conversation yesterday uh, and the day before, but it doesn't, it's so too administratively hard to do. And there's going to be so significant leakage from that. So providing, let's say they were saying that, oh, let's give cards to motorbike users. But I, I know my country, there, there's going to be a lot of problems with that system. Uh, and then, you, going down the route is not a really good idea and you're 
it's better to pass that on to people, tell them we are about to pass on, so people adjust their consumption behavior accordingly, and then uh, go into sort of trying to fix and try to deliver growth for people so the incomes rise. Providing subsidies on fuel is not the right strategy. It's not the right strategy even we have the money. In this case, we don't even have the money. I will stop there. Thank you, Sharuk. Um, uh, Baskar, do you have any concluding thoughts? Yeah. Do you want to add, Imran, anything to that? Yes, uh, I just want to uh, add uh, a little bit into it, what okay. uh, Mani has said. Now, apart from uh, um, uh, putting the economy on the right track, uh, we need to focus uh, on dealing with the terrorism, especially on the uh, Western border. So as the sustainability of the economic policies in Pakistan uh, requires both political stability and the stability on the border. So we, in that uh, direction, we have to take some pragmatic, as, as Asaf has said, pragmatic decision and sometimes the tough decisions, uh, like we have to just have to talk with, with the TTP and other factors, and we have to take some tough decisions on both sides, on the economic side, as well as on the border security side. Okay, all right, thank you. Ambassador Chaudhary, do you have any comment to add? I think the master is muted. Okay. Yeah, there, there you yeah. go. I'm so sorry. I, I must say that I enjoyed the answers given regarding, uh, by all of you, uh, regarding education in Sri Lanka. Uh, unfortunately, this question has been asked so many times from me also here, and it's based on such a ba bad understanding of uh, the correlation that education had with the, with the economic situation. On the whole, I agree with Mr. Vani that, you know, uh, a better educated society will be more productive, period. Uh, but you can't say that uh, uh, economic shocks will not happen. You can't say that uh, bad economic planning will not happen in educated societies. It will. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, therefore, I think I'm glad that this was cleared very well by all the speakers. Uh, thank you. Um, back to you, Neela. Thank you. Um, so that's, this brings us to the end of our discussion. I'll, I now invite Ambassador Khalid Mehu, Chairman BOG ISSI, for his uh, concluding thoughts and word of thanks to the audience. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. See, given the state of Pakistan's economy, I think uh, there could not have been a subject. Uh, more germane poor situation than Sri Lanka's uh, economic crisis. And I must say that uh, after hearing the distinguished speakers, participants in this webinar, I have learned a lot. But what pains me to observe is that here, it, Sri Lanka was a country uh, emerging, you know, country in the developing world. Uh, it had a standing at the international level, at the UN, leader in the law of the sea, uh, parlays, advocate of uh, uh, Indian Ocean as a zone of peace, uh, leading light in the SARC, uh, hub of uh, tourists, and uh, then what we now hear the alarming reports coming, how the economy has uh, melted down and uh, also that uh, political instability is gripping the country. So it really pains to uh, hear and view what's happening in uh, uh, Sri Lanka. But the speakers have told us that uh, uh, this is not a sudden development. Uh, this has been coming for quite some time, you know, uh, that uh, it was the, unfortunately, you know, uh, the country was just settling down in the post uh, insurgency period. And then uh, COVID comes in, uh, political instability takes hold of the country. Uh, and uh, according to the participants, 
some wrong economic policies, you know, are responsible for this uh, really terrifying situation uh, Sri Lanka is facing. For me as layman, you know, the, uh, my takeaway from uh, uh, this discussion is that one should live within one's means. You know, if one doesn't live within one's means, then it means you have to depend on others. You have to borrow. Okay, you borrow then, but you then invest the credit into some productive fields. If not, then this uh, economic burden, you know, in fact, instead of uh, uh, decreasing, it uh, multiplies and mounts. So this is what has happened in Sri Lanka. And this is the story in other developing countries, including uh, Pakistan. So I'm very glad to learn that uh, the solutions which uh, the participants have advocated, they are very sound, uh, that uh, one should face the situation as it is. You cannot uh, push this under the rug, you know. Uh, the nation has to be taken into confidence. Then uh, policies which are economic, make economic sense, you know, those uh, not uh, liberal subsidies and uh, also, uh, you know, not projects uh, uh, which are not very productive undertaking of those projects uh, and uh, low taxes, you know, uh, or low tax collections, you know, all these uh, uh, issues have to be uh, addressed. Uh, in a very frontal manner. Uh, but on the other hand, I must say that uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, rule out uh, the political aspect of the whole situation. You know. uh, it, uh, of course, uh, uh, the prescription of the uh, participants of the seminar uh, are sound economically, but you have to sell them to the public also. And that only is possible if uh, there's consensus, national consensus uh, on the gravity of the problem and also on the need for uh, adopting the right measures to address uh, all the ailments uh, afflicting the country's economy. So live within your means. If not, you can sustain only for, for a while but ultimately that situation would be uh, unsustainable. And as it rightly been said, that uh, uh, right decisions at the right time, that is the uh, call of the day. Thank you very much to all the participants for enriching this uh, uh, webinar uh, organized by the Center Institute of Strategic Studies, uh, Islamabad. Uh, on the very relevant, important issues in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Mahmood, for your final thoughts. Uh, uh, let me join Ambassador Mahmood and Ambassador Chaudhary in thanking our participants, our speakers who have joined us from uh, uh, Washington, D.C., London, Colombo, Sri Lanka, and others who have joined us for this important discussion. It indeed was very enriching for all of us. Uh, we at the Center, Center for Strategic Perspectives, are in the process of uh, compiling an economic uh, a report on Pakistan's economic security, and we uh, will be adding the re concrete recommendations that have been put forth by our uh, speakers uh, at today's discussion, and we will be presenting it to the government of Pakistan uh, in, uh, by 16th uh, June 2022. I thank you all for joining us. Allah Hafiz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you very much.